now on ABC Radio National, it's time for Counterpoint, an hour of opinion and discussion with Paul Conry thompson and Michael Duffy. Hello and welcome to the program. In a moment, we put a rocket under the Australian legal system. For decades, the distinguished journalist Evan Witten has been observing how the law really works. His conclusion, it's a cartel run by lawyers and judges for their own benefit. So what price justice? And Cardinal Pearl, the Catholic Archbishop of Sydney, has a new book. It's called Test Everything. It's a collection of over 80 of his essays and speeches, as well as discussing the church and belief. I'll ask the Cardinal for his assessment of the state of atheism. And here's an historical uh, curiosity. In February 2008... The New York Times reported, and I quote, George W. Bush is in line to be the first president since World War II to preside over an economy in which federal government employment rose more rapidly than employment in the private sector. And in uh, 2009-10, under President Obama, the trend has accelerated, especially in California. Now, why is that? Today, Stephen Greenhut takes us through his account of these developments. He sees it as a class war, where in California public servants have become the new masters. His story is coming up later in the program. But our first guest today is Evan Witten. Evan's an award-winning journalist. He's written frequently about organised crime in books such as Can of Worms and Amazing Scenes. More recently, he's turned his attention to Australia's adversary legal system, which of course we inherited from the British, arguing that the European investigative model is far more efficient and also more just. His latest book's called Our Corrupt Legal System, with a nice subtitle, Why Everyone is a Victim Except Rich Criminals. Evan Witten, welcome to the program. Thank you, Michael. Most of us are familiar with the adversary system, which uh, in a sense privatises justice as in an updated version of trial by combat. But could you briefly describe for us the European system? Well, the European system, unlike our system, uh, is based on the idea that the, the idea is to find the truth. Our system is the only system in the world which says that truth doesn't matter. It's the only system in the world which conceals evidence from jurors. The European system tries to find the truth, and it also has trained judges trying to find the truth, rather than lawyers trying to uh, confuse the issue. And how does it work over there? How would they conduct a trial? Well, if, if, if it's a serious case, they have a, a jury and the jury sits on the bench with the, the judge or judges, three judges and nine jurors, say. They hear just enough evidence to you know, establish the truth. They need to go on forever. In the way our system works, where lawyers control the uh, evidence, they, they just can spin it out for months, you know. And the result of the European system trying to find the truth is that in criminal cases, they put away twice as many guilty criminals as we do at half the cost. <laughs> I think we'll come back to that in a moment. But am I right in thinking that over there the judges um, <clears throat> tend to direct the course of the trial? In other words, it's not largely in the hand of lawyers as it is here. No, it, it, they, the judges control the evidence and, and just as importantly, they let the witnesses give the evidence as a narrative. It's none of this yes or no stuff which you can, you know, you can force a guy to lie by asking him to say yes or no. It's all predicated on, you know, the fundamental thing is what is the truth? And uh, I suppose we ought to talk about what is justice. Uh, we, might, we might talk about that in a moment, but I have been discussing your book with many people and most of them have told me that we need our system, our system is superior because in it corrupt police and evil judges can't jail innocent people, which apparently they believe happens regularly in France and Germany. Now before we discuss that, let me ask a preliminary question. Do we know how many of the people who are charged and go to trial are actually innocent? Uh, an American lawyer, Alan Dershowitz, who says that most of his clients were guilty, uh, he says almost all and he says also that all judges and all lawyers know that almost all accused are guilty. Um, judge Rothwax says that's 90%. I think it's probably somewhere between 90 and 95, probably at the top end of the 95, are guilty. 
Well, that's interesting because it does seem to be a, a fairly widespread perception that there's a flood of innocent people being hauled before the courts. Well, that's uh, nonsense. That's nonsense. Well, why, why would you do it? Why, why would you bother? And the other great concern is that uh, innocent people will get convicted in the absence of the adversary system. It's better that nine guilty people, you know, be freed and that one innocent person go to jail. Do we actually know how many innocent people do get convicted under our system? Well, um, let me say, first of all, under the other system, there was evidence uh, given to a, a, an English inquiry after the Birmingham Six were found to be <laughs> not guilty. They did some examination of the, of the French and German systems, and they found there that the uh, innocent... There were so many filters that the innocent were unlikely to be charged even, let alone convicted more so than in our system, because our system is an adversary system and it's a winner-take-all, win-at-all-cost win sort of thing, so the prosecutors will also do a bit of jiggery-pokery. To answer your question, I think Ludovic Kennedy found that uh, in England there was at least 1% of people in prison are innocent. The figures from America are, of course, America is the home of wretched excess at all things, and uh, in America, it's, it's upwards of 5%. That's 5 in 100, 50 in 1,000. And, of course, they put away everybody in, in, in America goes to jail. They, they can, uh, it's a really bad system, and, and a lot of people are innocent and on death row. All right, so you'd be suggesting that in the adversary system, compared with the investigative one, more innocent people go to jail and far fewer guilty people go yeah, to jail. Absolutely. Which is a double failing. Of course. Well, that's the whole point of it. Well, but... you say of course, but I think that will surprise many of our listeners. Would it? Well, what about the length and cost of trials under the two systems? In the, in the European system, or Bonaparte system, as, as, as Ludovic Kennedy said, justice is too important to be left to judges, it was Bonaparte who, changed, who wasn't a judge who, who fixed up the European system. Under that system, the judges who are in control of the whole process have no incentive to spin the process out. They're not getting paid by the hour, as, as lawyers are, 10000 a day or something like that. They have no incentive to spin it out. And a, uh, as Justice Fox says, a, a civil trial in France and Germany, usually takes no more than a day in total. And, you know, a civil trial here can go for 15 years <laughs> because the lawyers have an incentive to spin it out and the lawyers have both the motive and the opportunity to spin it out. You talked about an inquiry after the freeing of the Birmingham Six. I think that was called the Runciman Inquiry, wasn't it? That's right. Have there been many other... Uh, extensive comparisons or thorough comparisons of the two systems? I think you'll find that uh, people in the adversary system know nothing about the European system. Um, law schools, I think, I think really law schools, they should be run off a campus on a rail, I think, because uh, what, what a university is supposed to try and improve the product the medical school tries to improve how people are dealt with medically and so on. But law schools do not try to find out where the system came from, how it works, how it could be better. They just say, this is the best system and this is how it's done and that's it. Evan, if the differences between the two systems are so enormous, why don't we, why don't we change? You've already talked about the, the failure of the law schools. Are there other reasons why we don't change to what sounds like a vastly superior way of doing things? For one thing, lawyers have been in control of English-speaking parliaments. They've been the dominant influence in English-speaking parliaments since about 1350. And uh, as I say, this, uh, this is uh, unfair to untrained lawyers, lawyers in the parliament and it also <laughs> tends to stop any change. And uh, you've actually described the current arrangement as a cartel, haven't you? Could you, could you explain in which way it resembles a cartel? Well, that, uh, that's, that word comes from uh, an economist, a Chicago economist, uh, and an appellate judge, uh, judge, Chief Judge Richard Posner, head of the appeals court in centred on Chicago. This is Richard Posner, yeah? Richard Posner. Mm. He says it's always been a cartel of judges, lawyers, and later on academics. And um, 
A cartel, as you know, colludes, members of a cartel collude to uh, increase prices and therefore profits. And um, basically, uh, that cartel began as soon as the common law began, you know, in, in the 12th century. And it's always operated that way to uh, improve the profits of lawyers. Your book uh, has a lovely quote from Charles Dickens. The one great principle of the English law is to make business for itself. <laughs> well, Dickens in, uh, was, was referred, that's in Bleak House, uh, and Bleak House uh, uh, is the, the great case in, in uh, Bleak House, which is Dickens' masterpiece of Jarndyce v. Jarndyce, is based on a famous English case called Jennings v. Jennings. And the way the cartel worked in Jennings v. Jennings and in and in the the Chancery Court was that in will cases the lawyers were paid not by the clients but out of the deceased estates and so the judges colluded with the lawyers to just not to finalise the case and the lawyers turned up every now and again took took the money from the estate uh, that started in 1650 or thereabouts in Jennings v Jennings that started in 1798 still going when Dickens wrote about in 1853, and it ended only in 1915. 117 years that case ran while the lawyers uh, milked an estate worth a billion and a half of our money. Probably put a lot of young lawyers' sons through Eton, didn't it? I should think so. (laughs) Even if we did change, hypothetically, of course, what effect would that have on the personnel now involved in trials, I assume we'd need more judges. Absolutely, um, and and uh, better still, fewer lawyers. Um, there are more lawyers in Washington, town of five hundred thousand, than there are in the whole of France. Uh, you'd need six times as many judges, but it would be a lot cheaper. It'd be more just, more fair, and a lot cheaper. Let's talk now about some of the ways that that defence lawyers are able to get accused people off, uh, even guilty people off, which I presume creates a stronger market for their services. You actually list 24 devices used in court to prevent the truth coming out. Um, We've only got time for a few, but but let's talk about them. First of all, the right to silence. What's wrong there? Well, the right to silence, as you might expect, is based on a lie by the uh, first academic uh, charlatan named Blackstone, uh, he just he it's it's a lie by omission. George Orwell says you know the most powerful lie is the omission, and uh, he just he just uh, Blackstone just trimmed off two thirds of the law on um, if you are accused you have to give an explanation. He just said if you're accused you don't you don't have to say anything. You have the right of silence. So. Uh, he just lied about it, and that was taken over by the Americans in the Fifth Amendment and, and became part of the law. I should say for our listeners who are fortunate enough not to have encountered this themselves that not only do you not have to speak to the police if you're charged, you don't have to speak in court, do you? That law, based on that, it's a rule of evidence, the right of silence, privilege against self-incrimination, uh, actually... There are figures to suggest that it gets off by itself 25% of guilty accused. That's an amazing figure. Do, do you think that's a, a reliable figure? I didn't make it up. There, are, mm, it, yeah. It's supported by quotes from people in mm. the book. In, in Europe, in France or Germany, that's not possible? I mean, the right to silence, do they? Can uh, you stay no, quiet? No, if, if you're trying to find the truth, everybody who knows something... And, and the suspect will know more than most. Everybody who knows something has to say something, mm. has, has to be available for uh, investigation. What about the notion of precedent, of telling juries about some of the past things that accused people have done? Um, Which, of course, you're not allowed to do under our system, pretty pretty much. The rule against, uh, that's the so-called rule against similar facts, that was invented in 1894, it's a rule against pattern evidence, and uh, Judge Fox, who I quote quite often in the book, he says that that an understanding of facts depends heavily on context. 
the rule against pattern evidence knocks out pretty well all the context. So you don't hear what the guy's done before, whether he's committed 24 rapes before or whether he's interfered with, uh, you know, 20 students at a college. Uh, they knock out all that stuff and, and it, it just gets down in the end to one person's word against another. And yeah, The argument they would use is that the fact that someone's done something 20 times before doesn't make it any more likely that he would do it in this case. What would you say to that? There's a classic case of a, a very incompetent Welsh thief who was done 247 times for theft, found guilty. Now, what the law against uh, similar facts does, the law against pattern, is that it obliges prosecutors to lie by omission to the jurors. The accused is presented as a first offender, whereas he's committed 247 previous offence of theft, and this Welsh guy was presented as a first offender, and on the 248th time he got off. One last example of how courts can, can hide the truth or, or certainly distort it, uh, plea bargaining, very common in Australia, yet I, I learned from your book it doesn't even exist in the investigative system. What's the, what's the problem with it? Plea bargaining uh, was invented in America, really, because they found the rules for concealing evidence were so severe that they could hardly get anybody, put anybody away, really. So they offered them a plea, uh, a no-risk offer. Suppose you take a few years and wear that, or we'll go on with the case and you might get a 100. So what do you, what do you want? So they, they work it down. Uh, the judges who are currently being charged in Pennsylvania with corruption have, have tried to plea bargain their, their you know, the corruption down to you know, a few years. It's not trying to find the truth. The truth doesn't come into it. We're just, we're just an offer to you to, if you want to go to jail for a bit or for no time at all. Just admit it and, and we'll give you a few months, a few years. And what happens in Europe? Well, in Europe, there's no such thing as a guilty plea. The judge, the whole emphasis on finding the truth, the judge has to find, or the judge and jury, have to find out the truth for themselves. And they know perfectly well that um, a guilty plea is not necessarily the truth because, as the Birmingham Six found out, the coppers uh, tortured them until they were prepared to sign anything. One last example, I, I just want to throw this in, I can't resist it, uh, client-lawyer privilege whereby communications between lawyers and their clients are normally confidential and, uh, and no one can find out what happened. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that it allows lawyers and criminals to collude or to conspire to commit crimes. And that one, the, the, the privilege against the client-lawyer secrecy privilege, was the first of the great concealing things that the judges brought in when, when lawyers first started to defend criminals. They, that was the first thing that came in, came in 1792, that one. And it, it just enables law, uh, criminals and, 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 and lawyers to collude, to you know, carry out crime. And what, uh, what sort of crime? Any crime, organised crime, if you know, as, as Raymond Chandler says, where, where would the big hoods be if, if they didn't have lawyers to tell them how to get away with it? The real argument against it is that people in business don't have this privilege. If, if, if you're in a business and you're charged with something or other, you have to disclose everything. You can't just hide behind anything. The argument I'm making is that the law is a business and so you shouldn't have this privilege. So, Evan Whitten, in your view, what is justice? Well, I, I adopt the, the, the um, definition by uh, Justice Russell Fox, who researched the law for 11 years after he retired from the Federal Court in Australia. And his definition is this. Justice means fairness. Fairness means means truth, truth means reality, and the search for truth gives a legal system its moral dimension. Otherwise, he says, 
the likely winner will be the one with the most money and the cleverest lawyers. And because our system does not try to find the truth, it does not tick any of those Justice Fox's boxes. And I, I could also say that Justice Fox also says that the public know that justice marches with the truth. And what that means is that 99.8% of the population believe justice marches with the truth and the other 0.2% lawyers and judges believes it doesn't. And, and finally, uh, what I'm saying, if, if any politician was game enough to change this, try to change the system to a truth-seeking system, he would have the support for the first and last time in his life by the vast majority of voters. Evan Whitten, we could go on for a long time, I'm sure, but I think that's probably enough for today. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Evan Whitten's latest book is called Our Corrupt Legal System, subtitled Why Everyone is a Victim Except Rich Criminals. That's published by BookPal, and we'll put a link to that on our website. Still to come on CounterPoint, the EU has delivered a stern message to Greece. Cut pensions and benefits or face bankruptcy. But the state of California, with more than three times the population of Greece, faces even bigger problems. Schools, hospitals and police services are being cut back. But in the midst of all this belt tightening, former public uh, sector employees are doing very nicely, thank you. And the people of California are not happy. Stephen Greenhut tells us all about it as he discusses his recent book, Plunder how public employee unions are raiding treasuries, controlling our lives and bankrupting the nation. And coming up next on CounterPoint, uh, Cardinal Pell, the Archbishop of Sydney, discusses his new book, which is called Test Everything. Be part of Bluebird AR, an exciting thriller that's unfolding in real time across the internet, where you you actively actively shape shape the story. story. Geoengineering. Should we deliberately manipulate the Earth's environment to counteract climate change? Should you try to stop it? Is it safe to bleach the sky by pumping aerosol sulfates into the stratosphere to cool the planet? What do you think? think? Bluebird AR, the ABC's Online alternate reality drama. Unlock the mystery at abc.net.au slash bluebird.